The reading is taken from 1 Peter 1, verses 1 to 2, and 1 Peter 5, verses 12 to 14. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And from 1 Peter 5, 12 to 14. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Greet one another with a kiss of love. We, I can take my mask off, but I, I can't kiss you. Uh, we have to find creative ways to uh, follow that injunction, I think, and uh, show love to each other and greet one another. Let's pray. Lord, help us to feed on your word. Nourish us, we pray. Amen. If you're like many people, you may well sense from time to time that the difference between opting to be a Christian and not to be a Christian these days is a fairly evenly balanced thing. There are strong intellectual minds arguing on each side. To be a Christian is not as popular with other people as it was a generation ago. And in some contexts, it's viewed with increasing suspicion. To be involved in the life of the church was inconvenient before, perhaps, but now it's just quite an effort for not that much fun. Unless, of course, you're in one of our two fantastic home groups, and then you're probably having lots of fun, even if it's on Zoom. Everyone else except me you might think, is just a bit odd in the church. But on the other hand, to trust that there is a God who will forgive us and love us and take care of us is a very big plus. And then we sense that the arguments are poised. And perhaps we say, well, it just about comes out that the Christian side has stronger arguments And so, on balance, I'll opt for a Christian worldview. Well, just imagine for a moment a time and place where persecution of Christians is real. Imagine in Bath in 2020, if you're a professing Christian, that you turn up for work tomorrow morning and you get a call and you're asked a series of questions, the outcome of which might be that you lost your job because of your Christian faith. Or were invited to an interview with the police, out of which charges arise and you face a prison sentence or the confiscation of your property. Now, let's be honest as we imagine that, those scenarios. If you or I were in that situation, Would we really be opting for Christianity? Where do you stand this morning? I don't know for each individual watching how committed you are, whether Jesus Christ is a personal reality for you, whether this is something you're unsure about at the moment. How convinced are you? I guess for many of us, persecution might actually tip the balance. Would it be enough 
to end the intellect, intellectual stalemate in favor of a respectful agnosticism. Is it a shock to us to realize that there are many parts of the world today, and there always have been, where people become Christians knowing that they will face real and immediate persecution? Well, this was the situation of the first readers of Peter's letter. And as we read the first couple of chapters of this letter over the next five weeks, let's ask ourselves, were the, those readers like us or were they religious fanatics? For us, the issues seem so evenly balanced, so confused. Some of us even make a virtue out of confusion. I heard someone say recently, you wouldn't want a vicar that was too sure about their faith. For folk reading this letter, originally, it must have been very clear cut indeed. You and I wouldn't opt for something which would lead us to lose our salaries tomorrow morning and our property unless we were very clear about it. So I want to ask this morning, have they, the first readers of Peter's letter, got things out of proportion or have we? That's a, a question that this letter is going to keep asking us. What is there about Christianity that makes it so special, worth dying for? It's my prayer that our own view of these things will become a bit more like theirs as we study this letter together this autumn. And we start today with the top and tail of the letter, which Paul read for us, the first couple of verses and the last three verses, to get a clear idea of what we're going to read. And the first couple of verses, I think, are a bit like the header of an email from Peter. And uh, we know who he was, the same one who was up the mountain with Jesus, we heard a few weeks ago, when he saw the light and heard the voice. The same Peter that, a bit later on, denied Jesus and was then restored. Peter, who before that had been called the rock with his confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. We heard in chapter 5 that Peter was writing from a place he called Babylon. That's a reference, I'm pretty sure, to Rome as a powerful city that was opposed to God. And chapter 5, verse 12, tells us Silas, or Silvanus, was Peter's scribe. And I guess people earn PhDs arguing about these things and what exactly was the interaction between Peter and Silvanus, uh, but I think what we've seen and heard there is enough for us today. Coming back to this email header, we've seen it's from Peter, it's to, what does it say, verse 1, God's elect scattered throughout all these places with funny names that Paul did so well to read. There they are on, are on a bit of a, a map um, which came from the, the Bible project. And they're all places in modern-day Turkey. We heard again at the end of the letter that the readers were chosen by God, God's elect. And emails often have a, a carbon copy address, don't they? Um, so we might say this is CC St. Nicholas Barthampton, among other places. And then the subject line, keep going under pressure, might be a good summary, I think we'll see in the rest of the letter. Again, Peter comes back to that theme right at the end. I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. So how does he encourage them to keep going, to stand fast? Looking at verses 1 and 2, the key is to remember who you are and remember whose you are. Remember who you are, verse 1. Do you ever feel forgotten? Do you ever feel insignificant? Do you ever feel marginalised? I'm reminded of the old 
doctor, doctor joke. I never found these jokes funny. I don't know about you. But doctor, doctor, I feel like people are ignoring me. You heard this one before. Do you remember what uh, the next line is? Next. But it might touch a nerve, even though it's not funny. If we feel as though things are, are happening all around us, and we feel left out. For persecuted Christians, I guess it can be because of their faith that people won't take them seriously and overlook them. But maybe as they go through great pressure, they feel as though even God is overlooking them as he blesses other people. As a church, we might see other churches being blessed and feel so small and insignificant ourselves. And yes, we can see great ways that God is blessing our church, but we might be feeling overlooked by him. Peter wants to reassure his readers that whatever is happening, they've not been forgotten. And this applies to all who put their trust in Jesus, not just first century Turkish Christians. You are the elect chosen by God. Originally, the phrase God's chosen people was applied to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but now it's different. And Peter knows this. He was personally involved in bringing this about. Um, if you look at Acts chapter, chapters sort of 10 to 15, the door is being opened to the Gentiles, and Peter plays a key role in that, in God's plan. Peter knew that he had been personally selected by Jesus himself at the start of the Lord's ministry. And he says that every Christian can consider themselves personally chosen by God. Did you ever have the experience of lining up to be picked for a football team and being overlooked. Believer, here, God has picked you. Your exiles scattered in the world. That's the other thing Peter says about his readers. They've been chosen by God, and so they're citizens of heaven, but they are not home in heaven yet. In the Old Testament, God's people faced times in exile, a long way from their homeland. Babylon was a hostile environment to to faith in the one true God. There was pressure to conform to the pagan culture of the place. Remember what happened to Daniel's friends when they were there in Babylon thrown into a furnace. In New Testament times, there was still a diaspora scattered throughout the Roman Empire away from their promised land. Peter picks up that theme and applies it to his Christian readers. They're not to regard Pontus or Galatia as home. As with Old Testament believers on their way to the promised land, their true home lies elsewhere. So their allegiance is not to the surrounding culture. Their allegiance is to Christ, who will one day gather up his people and bring them home. We'll see more of this theme later in the letter. It's the same for all Christian believers. We are aliens, strangers in the world here. We live in Barthampton, many of us, or nearby, but that's not our real home. We're aliens, strangers in the world here. So if we don't fit in, that's not necessarily a bad sign. And so there is a tension because of these two things. Life as God's elect in exile. We're chosen by God with a future home in glory, but we're currently in exile surrounded by hostile forces. These two facts guarantee that you and I will face some kind of suffering because of who we are and how we live. 
living differently from the people around and facing a hard time for it are two major themes in this letter. And Peter has introduced those two themes right in the first verse, both of them. So remember who you are and remember whose you are. Why are Christian believers elect exiles? Because of who they belong to. You belong to God, the Father. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in verse 2, uses the Greek word from which we get our word prognosis. So the doctor tells you how your health is likely to progress or likely to change following intervention. It speaks of knowledge of the future. Either the, the doctor can see the future coming and he's powerless to alter events, or the doctor is actively intervening to bring about a particular outcome, and she can see and know this is what's going to happen. And it's in that latter sense that Peter uses the word. God's plan throughout history is not merely foreseen, it's not out of his control, it's actively planned and brought about. Verse 19 tells us Christ the Lamb was chosen before the creation of the world because God planned Jesus' death from the beginning. In the same way, we Christians have been known by God the Father from the very beginning and we belong to him. And you belong to God the Holy Spirit. Do you know the word sanctification? In theology, it technically means the process by which believers grow in holiness. Sanctification comes after justification, when God declares us not guilty on the basis of Jesus' righteousness and his blood and through faith in him. But the word sanctification is not always used in that technical theological sense in the New Testament. To sanctify means to holify. To the use and no else's. So sometimes the New Testament talks about sanctification as coming before justification where sanctification is not referring to this process of becoming more holy, becoming more like Jesus, but it's in the sense of, of setting us apart and opening our heart to trust and obey Jesus. The Spirit then is involved in the proclamation of the gospel, verses 10 to 12 of this chapter, which leads by the Spirit's work in our hearts to new birth, verses 23 to 25. The Spirit rests on the believer even in suffering. A hostile world might set us apart to pick on us, but God's Holy Spirit has set us apart and picked us to belong to him. You belong to God the Father, you belong to God the Holy Spirit, and you can see what the third point is going to be, can't you? You belong to God the Son, Jesus Christ. There are different ways of talking about being converted, becoming a Christian. Are we still on? Something went funny on the screen there, but I think we're, I think we're okay. Uh, being, believing Christ, being born again, being called... Um, are all ways that Peter refers to becoming a Christian. And the main way that he, his term for it is obedience. Why not have a look later on in your Bible through the five chapters of 1 Peter and see how many times you can see the term obedience to God's word or obedience to Christ as referring to becoming a Christian. It's not all about what we do, though. It's about what we receive from him as we submit to him. Verse 
The Old Testament background for this expression is that after God rescued his people, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt, God had Moses sprinkle the people with blood to show that they belonged to God and were forgiven by God. So blood, the sprinkling of blood, symbolizes the covenant. So when we're feeling quite ordinary, remember who we are and whose we are. When we're feeling weak, remember God has chosen us. When we're tempted to blend in with the values of the culture around us, remember we're not part of that. We are exiles in the world. We don't belong to that. We stick out. And when we fail, when we fail to stick out, when we displease Jesus in our attitudes and our actions, then remember the sprinkled blood of Jesus bringing forgiveness as his chosen people we are secure let's pray Father God we thank you for your great kindness in choosing us who don't deserve it making us your children thank you that we can say we're your treasured possession because in Jesus you love us as you love your own son we thank you for that and we ask you to help us remember who we are when we're feeling low and feeling discouraged or when we're feeling proud of ourselves turn our hearts to remember we are chosen by you because of your grace and we belong to you and we're secure and so help us to to live as your children in this hostile world as exiles Help us to remember where our true home is and to live and speak appropriately. For Jesus' sake, amen.